Okay. Well, welcome everybody. I'm going to, um, for those who are tuning in on YouTube, maybe at a later date, we're recording this in June of 2022, and I'm just going to leave the opening prayer uh, on the screen here for just a second. That's the prayer we always start with. And I'll, in a minute here, I'll direct all my attention to the people in the room. We'll let the recording take care of itself. But for those of you who might be seeing this for the first time or just watching it on YouTube, um, this prayer that we have here, it's a prayer to the Trinity. Um, and I wrote it uh, as, a, as a way of giving expression to the way the early church viewed the uh, mystery of, of Christ and his relationship to the Father and the Spirit. So we praise the Father for his power and love and look at him as the creator. And then we say, glory be to the Son who in his incarnation became man so that I could become God. And when um, we use that prayer, I use this for different classes that I have to teach. And I hand out this holy card and this prayer card as often as I can. And part of the purpose is to be provocative with that second stanza of the prayer, glory be to the son who in his incarnation became man so that I could become God. Because the notion that human beings could become God sounds so unfamiliar to our ears and um, lest anybody immediately want to run off and accuse me of heresy to the inquisition, I put a little yeah. footnote there on the, on the prayer card itself and referred the prayer or the ones who use this card to St. Athanasius's work called On the Incarnation, uh, chapter 54, where um, St. Ignatius, uh, or St. Athanasius rather, uh, goes into some explanation and, and continues to write profoundly about what the early church talked about as the process of deification, divinization. And that's kind of where we always start on these uh, gatherings. We're trying to um, trying to return, really, which itself was the purpose of the Second Vatican Council. We're trying to return to a more Catholic view of the Catholic faith. <laughs> that is to say, a more expansive view, both width-wise and depth-wise. And that, that vision of who Christ is, what our place in Christ is, what the place of the entire creation in the mystery of Christ is, uh, requires that we expand our view of the Christ beyond the incarnation of the, per, of the, of, of the man, Jesus of Nazareth. So most of our focus in our Catholic Christianity and Christianity in the West, uh, at least since the 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth centuries, has focused more narrowly on the physical rather than on the more expansive Trinitarian view of who God is. So we know that God has appeared in the flesh in the second person of the Trinity incarnate, but we also know that that person who was who assumed a human nature in the womb of Mary, we also know that that person pre-existed his incarnation in, in, in the flesh. And we also know through the mystery of the resurrection, ascension, and dispensation of the Holy Spirit that in some sense, the person of the Christ, the second person of the Trinity, also post-exists his physical existence as a human being in the body of the one from Nazareth. So, uh, so we're trying to stretch that vision in these gatherings. That's the purpose of us getting together and, and to begin to figure out how what we learned about God um, can, can also be stretched to accommodate a tradition within the world both within the Christian world and within the ancient classical world, and even with respect to the modern post-Christian world, the question becomes for us is how can I take what I learned in my religion and try to, 
try to see it in a larger context. What does it have to say to, to me today where we live in a world that does not support the Christian vision, does not support Christian values, is very much akin to the Roman Empire of total paganism and violence that the gospel arose in in the first place? What's the relationship of Christ to culture? That's, that's one question we can ask. I want to maybe touch on that a little bit today, if, if it seems appropriate, it probably will. I'll try to weave it into what, what, where I feel being led today in the gathering. And we can also integrate any questions you may have. Um, those who are watching these gatherings on YouTube may not feel the same continuity of the gatherings that we who are here every week can, can kind of piece together like rosary beads strung together with a thread. Um, and I am going to put up, you remember last time in the gathering, I put up and I think handed out to everybody who was here, uh, a couple of quotes by St. Maximus the Confessor, and also some quotes from David Bentley Hart. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on David Bentley Hart today, but he's a, he's a current spokesperson who comes from the Eastern Orthodox tradition, which is more in touch with the ancient Christian faith, generally speaking, than, 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 than the churches in the West, both Catholic and the churches of the Reformation. We have kind of, in a certain sense, cut ourselves off from a deeper tradition within the Christian East and within the Orthodox communion itself. So um, now there's been lots of attempts made, of course, to, to try to reconnect with that more ancient tradition. As I said a minute ago, the, 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 the Council of Vatican II was an attempt to return to the sources. They, they called it a ressourcement in French, uh, a return to the foundations, to the fountainhead, really, to the wellspring. The, the, the faith, the vision of the faith and the excitement about the faith that caused the apostles to break out of that room on Pentecost and start telling people, babbling really about something that they had experienced. Christianity always comes back to a foundational experience of something that we really can't explain. We can only share. Christianity ultimately is caught, not taught. And over the centuries, whatever that, whatever that initial fire was, whatever that initial impetus was, whatever that initial enthusiasm was, and we know that it lasted in, in a certain form, lasted for about 500 years, really, you might say it, maybe it petered out even before that, it, it certainly, the church was certainly on fire as a very small cultural minority, a hidden cultural minority for fear of their lives. The Romans uh, intuitively understood Christianity in a way much better than even most contemporary Catholics understand Christianity. They saw that Christianity itself, worshiping a God who is above all the other gods, worshiping an emperor who claims to be more powerful than any earthly power, they saw that that was a threat to their own domination of people's lives and control of the religious community. Similarly, within Judaism, the scribes and the Pharisees saw that this man from Nazareth was a threat to their authority. Um, they, that's why they put him on the cross. They experienced him as teaching heresy. They thought he was not biblical, to quote, quote my good friend William's phrase. You know, are, is he biblical? No, he's not biblical. He's contradicting the, the, the prophets. In fact, he's making himself God. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard it said by Moses, such and such, but I say to you, so constantly they were asking him, are you greater than Moses? Are you greater than Abraham? And he says very provocative things like, before Abraham was, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, you can imagine established uh, authorities yeah. saying, where does he get, well, even the people of Nazareth says, where does he get all this? <laughs> and, and, you know, that can be said in any number of ways, where do, meaning, meaning basically, where, where does he get off saying things like this? So he was coming from a place that they could not comprehend, and because it did not fit into their religious box for the Jews, 
and because it did not fit into their political box for the, for the Romans, both of them, even though they hated each other, and this, is, and this is another thing that Christ reveals about the nature of Satan casting out Satan. Uh, Satan is always the accuser, but he turns into Beelzebul at a certain point. Satan casts out Satan when Satan turns from the Diabolos, or the accuser, when he turns from the, the accuser and the Diabolos, the divider, then he turns into a unanimous voice of accusation. So the, the Romans hate him, and they accuse him of being seditionist. The Jews hate him because they accuse him of being an idolatrist. And those two forms of accusation mold into one form of accusation. So enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that's the nature of evil. That's the meaning of Satan casting out Satan, by the way, just as an aside here. It's Satan making common cause. Satan casts out Satan. So, so unanimity among enemies makes friends in evil. <laughs> And they align themselves against Jesus, and it, it, the gospel even reflects this. Remember, it says Pilate and Caiaphas were enemies, but on that day they became friends because they had a common enemy. So, so, so the established orders, you see, Christ was put to death to ensure the established order. I'm getting off on a little tangent here today because what, what I'm trying to show you is that in the early church and in the Roman Empire, uh, Christianity was viewed as a threat. And yet, people were still, still, some people were so taken by it that they were willing to buy in to this movement, which, because of its association with the original seditionist and, and idolater, uh, could cost them their lives. They were expelled from the synagogues and they were hunted down by the authorities, both religious and legal. And so they took refuge underground. So that's why the catacombs in Rome. So for the first 300 years of the church, ever following Pentecost, you saw, you can see in the Acts of the Apostles, the epistles of Peter, you can see the frustration that Paul is running into when he's trying to convince his fellow Jews that Jesus is not a contradiction of the prophets. He's the fulfillment of the prophets. He's not come to abolish them. He's come to fulfill them which is what exactly the gospel we had today in the liturgy. But he was not able to do it. They were not able to, they were not, now Paul was seized by a vision. Paul himself had been a persecutor of those seditionists. So what I'm trying to say here is, is that there was a, there was a grit and there was a determination and there was an inspiration among the early followers that made them willing to suffer and die for that which had been communicated to them. So the question is always, what was communicated to them? What, what, how, what was it that impacted them so greatly that they, and so Paul tried to put it into words, John tried to put it into words. By this time, all the other apostles were dead. The, other, the earlier apostles never saw the emergence of Christianity beyond anything other than being basically um, uh, Jesus Jews. They were Jews who thought that the Messiah had already arrived. They were not aware of, of the impact that Jesus as this other thing, this revelation, this unveiling, this apocalypse of God's being, they were not aware of the full implications of that. Christ's actual physical life was like a time bomb going off, but a time a, 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 it was like a nuclear explosion. His death and resurrection were like a, a his death was the detonation, the annihilation of his corporeal existence. You know, just like in a nuclear explosion, matter atoms something physical is annihilated, but it's never destroyed. It's trans, trans, transformed into energy. And the energy of the annihilation greatly exceeds the matter of the detonation. And so similarly with the resurrection, the crucifixion, the slaying of the physical Christ led to an explosion of the energy of the spirit. 
And it was those first waves of resurrected energy that, we, that is being, being articulated in a rather physicalist way in the Acts of the Apostles with Pentecost. Pentecost is, is you know, when you watch a nuclear explosion, you see boom, 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 these, these concentric circles of energy go out and they shake the earth. Now imagine a nuclear explosion going out that shakes the foundations of the cosmos. Okay, that's what the resurrection was. And the coming of the spirit is like the heat and the light that, that are byproducts of this explosion. Okay, I'm using a metaphor here to describe the, what, the impact of the resurrection upon the world. Now, the original apostles had no way, they, would have, they, they wouldn't have known what I was just talking about. They would have known they were living in the wake of something tremendous that had happened, but they would have never been able to envision the full cosmic consequences of what happened in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. So the Ascension Pentecost are like the concentric circles pushing out from the original event of Christ's resurrection, okay? And that is what changed people. They were literally, it'd be like if you were caught up, you know, when you do see a, you know, when you see what a nuclear explosion does, I mean, it just, it, it you know, it incinerates the people that it just, what, what's the word they use? Yeah, I incinerate, I guess, annihilate it. Um, what's the word they use though? Um, you know, turns them to, 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 to cinders, you know? Uh, oh, in, incinerate. People are incinerated, but with the with but what happened with the resurrection was instead of having that destructive effect, it had a transfiguring effect. It turned normal human beings into something that were more like divine creatures. It gave them a supernatural strength. That's why they were able to endure their martyrdoms with joy. Okay, so whatever happened at the resurrection, uh, and so I'm, I'm spelling all this out right now to show you how different it was in the early church, and how our church, relatively speaking, is moribund, because our church is basically a commentary on something that happened a long time ago. We're living with we're living with a down-the-road description of something. We're looking through the wrong end, end of the telescope. We're looking at a faraway world, the world of Jesus way back then, and, and most religion has turned into an imitation of Christ. So you kind of peer through your historical telescope, and you see, you see this man of Nazareth giving these nice talks, and you hear his nice words, and then there's this legal authority over here who tells you how to interpret it. That's called the church. And then you have these expert interpreters called the priests, and they will, they will tell you what you need in order to get to heaven. Well, that's a completely foreign, that's a completely, completely secondhand rendition of what actually happened and, and what, is, what is still actually happening. So as these, as Pentecost, as the impact of the resurrection moved out into the world, it first transfigured these original witnesses, okay? And then through the power of that same explosion, what, which we call the Holy Spirit, and I can go back and show you how, all, how you would see all this in the scripture, but when Jesus says, I'm breathing on you, you receive the Holy Spirit. What he's saying now is that the breath that comes out of your mouth, especially around the forgiveness of sins, my breath, the breath of God's spirit that I had in me that impacted you, I am now bequeathing to you. So as you witness to others about me, they will receive a share in the same impact of me that you have received and that has transformed your life. You will be my witnesses. And, and that word witness has a much stronger sense than you'll just hear about me from those people. Those people's presence will communicate my risen presence to you. So Christianity is caught, not taught, okay? And it was in the gatherings like this, and it was in gatherings, especially around the Eucharist, that the same energy of the spirit that transformed those original witnesses 
other people in their presence caught the same fire that descended upon them at Pentecost. The descent of the Holy Spirit as tongues of fire is a metaphorical description of saying these people were on fire with an experience that turned them from ordinary human beings into something much different. They were still human, but now they were divine in a certain way. They, they, they acquired some of the attributes of God. They acquired prophecy. They acquired a gift to speak in different languages. They acquired the ability. I was in, um, I've been in several countries, Bangladesh, India, uh, and the Philippines in particular. Somebody asked me to give a talk on the Holy Spirit one time in the Philippines. None of them knew English. I gave the talk. There was no translator, except there was a woman there who was Filipino. She, I said, you better translate for them. She said, no, they understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> so it was an intuitive thing. So there's a dissolution of barriers when people witness in that manner that, 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 that allows things to get communicated, even if you're not using the same language. That's what you see in the Acts of the Apostles. And I've seen it in my life on a number of occasions. So all that being said, so as, as, as the, the impact of the resurrection moves outward, uh, so what? So just a brief, very roughshod historical note here. So, so, so this fire of the Holy Spirit upon the original apostles and then on, their, on, on the people who were converted by them, meaning on the people who caught fire from them, this movement spread. It spread like wildfire, literally. Okay, and so there were there were these believers in the risen Christ whose lives were completely changed. Again, it wasn't being changed with you've got a new code of ethics. They didn't do they didn't do anything differently. I mean, they they did do things differently, but but when they did things differently, they said, "Oh, this was what was meant by the law in the first place. This is how we were supposed to be keeping it in the first place." What they experienced ethically was never a con contradiction of the law. Jesus didn't teach a whole lot different from what Moses had taught. Moses taught love your neighbor as yourself, but he had a very narrow definition of who the neighbor was. It was a fellow Jew. Jesus did expand that to include anyone, but the ethic of the gospel is pretty much that of the law and the prophets, just amplified a little bit or stretched a little bit. So it wasn't ethics that made a difference. It was the impact of the witness that transformed their ethics. Morality always comes as, a, good morality always comes as a byproduct of a mystical vision, not the other way around. So, so now we, in, in our day, in my opinion, we have the mor moralistic or ethical cart before the mystical horse. We've lost our mystical vision, so we hold on to morality as a substitute for a vision of God and of our place in God that will allow us to do what we should without having to think about it. <laughs> Whereas here, we have to deliberate a lot about what the right thing to do is, and we wring our hands with anxiety because we don't always know what the right call is. But if we lived totally in Christ, we would never even have to deliberate. True freedom in Christ is the dissolution of the deliberative will and it's a, it's a it's an intuitively knowing how to do things that used to baffle me okay to quote another source okay so, so what i want to say about all that is so for 300 years you have a community spreading all over the world now some of the apostles like thomas go as far as india and china philip goes down to mark goes to egypt and alexandria um who was it? I think uh, Nathaniel went as far as Ethiopia. I can't remember where Philip was martyred. They were all martyred, but they went. And wherever they went, they had gatherings. That's what the church was. The word church really means gathering. It means, it means, it means those who are called out of the world into communion with each other to share a shared experience of the immediate presence of God. And, and as, 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 a, as an experience of the conquest of death. Okay, so it generated a certain fearlessness in the people that allowed them to become martyrs. Now, what happened in the year 312 was that the mother of the emperor, who, like every emperor before, before him, viewed Christianity as a threat to the empire. So, 
So there were a lot of persecutions of Christians because they didn't want anybody claiming Jesus is Lord rather than Caesar is Lord. So you have this whole art alternative community that is growing pretty large. I mean, where are their soldiers? You know, that's what that's what the Roman the Romans only understand power and and violence. And they're worried that this other Lord is going to marshal an army and they don't understand that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my father could send legions of soldiers right now, but it's not of this world. So all that you know already, but, but Rome didn't know that, and Rome didn't care. And this was just a, another rebellious movement that Rome felt like that it needed to squash sooner rather than later. So it paid it hardly any attention. But the Christians who died in the amphitheater, they paid it a lot of attention. But the funny thing is, the more they died, the more people wanted to join because they these pagans in the amphitheater whose lives were, I mean, we're talking about the end of the Roman Empire here. Their lives are just lived like our lives in ceaseless entertainment. It's just continuous satiation with food, drink, and entertainment. No work, everybody on the take, everybody bribing, everybody operating by lies and deceit. The whole thing was corrupt from top to bottom, just like current society. So, And then they saw these other people who have nothing. These people have everything and they're miserable. And the Christians have nothing and they're joyous and they're not even afraid to die. And that's amazed so many people like sleepless in Seattle, you know, whatever she has, I want. And so they, so they start asking to join and the Christians won't, for the most part, won't let them join. Number one, they're not sure who would be a spy. And secondly, they wouldn't know what it would take for them to be sincere. They'd have to prove themselves first, just like, you know, it was like the Marines. We only want a few good people. And they don't want anybody who, and so they, they were very circumspect about anybody who knocked on their door. So it was basically Christianity in the early years from the time of Jesus and the, and the Pentecost till about the year 312. They were a secret society that communicated in code. They marked their houses with the Im image of a fish. And they, 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 whenever they were talking to another person, they would kind of just like today in the political world, you got to feel out who it is you're talking to because it could be an enemy, could be somebody on the other side of the divide. So they're very circumspect and cautious. So the church remained relatively small, but very on fire. Okay, they kept alive what the first witnesses had communicated to them. In the year 312, Constantine, under the influence, the Emperor Constantine, the Roman Empire, under the influence of his, of his mother, uh, St. Helena, liberated the Christians from their, they, they were no longer declared an enemy of the state. In fact, Constantine fought a battle and claimed that he saw a vision holding the cross, so he put the cross on his soldiers' uniforms went into a battle where he was greatly outnumbered the bridge of minerva in rome he won the battle he declared the christ to be the the spiritual emperor of the realm and he declared christianity to be the official religion of the realm so he went from persecuting christianity to persecuting those who persecuted christians so you have reverse violence going on okay and i'm no church historian because there's lots of nooks and crannies to this and lots of wrinkles and it's not as smooth a process as I've dis dis decided. But at that point, you have hordes of people asking for baptism and the emperor commanding that whoever the head of these Christian gatherings is, he had to learn himself, what's your, what's your, what's your governance structure here? Well, we don't, we're really brothers and sisters. We don't have a governance structure, but we do have overseers, what we call today bishops. We have overseers. Well, bring me the overseers, he says. Okay, so he tells the overseers, I want you to baptize everybody I send to you, otherwise you'll be back in the catacombs. And I'm, I'm caricaturing this whole thing. It didn't go down exactly like this, but in the main, that's what happened. So, the, so now the overseers, some of whom are missing fingers, arms, hands, and tongues because of being arrested by the previous regimes in Rome, 
they're a little cautious of wanting to sidle up to the emperor. I mean, he could change his mind at any time. By the same token, we're happy to be out of the catacombs. So what to do? And so the church had a dilemma there about how much do we, how much do we go public? Well, eventually they were all in for it. So at that point, not, yeah, even at that point. So, so, so Constantine says, let me, let me build a church in here in Rome to honor your king, Jesus. So he said, well, you know, so St. Peter's, because Peter was the overseer of the apostles. He said, who should I make the church to, Peter? So, so St. Peter's in Rome was built by Constantine as, I want you to have a place to worship. Well, now that, that's important to remember that in the early church, when the church was still underground and not a public entity, it was the, the people who gathered there because it was so secret and because it was so difficult to find out where they were and what they believed and what they did, people would hear rumors, rumors start about these movements. And they were the early Christians were accused of two things, of being atheists because they did not believe in any of the Roman gods and they had no temples of worship. They had no places of worship where, how can you have a religion without a temple? You can't. How can you have a religion without a cult? You can't. So they don't have one. So they, they must be atheists. And they're also cannibals, because when we've had our spies watching their gatherings, they talk about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. So they're cannibals. And that's, and that's exactly why the early, the early, very early church fathers said, do not speak of these mysteries to any outsiders, because they will they, will, they don't have the capacity to understand what we have communicated to you as his witnesses. This is the mystical supper. This is the means he left us to put us back into one flesh communion with himself. He, 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 the basic experience of the early church that they were so intent on proclaiming is that the man of Nazareth is now still with us, but now he is in us, and we are in him. He has now assumed the form, not of a single human being, but of the whole of humanity. So every person you see is an extension of the one who is risen from the dead. Now, that's a mystical teaching that cannot be grasped by the materialist intellect, but it can be grasped by those who who are illumined by the spirit that Jesus gave. He said, I will lead you into all things. These things about myself that I am changing into you and you are changing into me. And we are now one person. That mystical truth was what Jesus was referring to when he said, the Holy Spirit will come. I have much more to say to you now about who I am, who God is, who you are, where you're going, what this is all about, what I intend to do in the future but you cannot bear it now. I've given you everything I can give you right now. I leave you my body and blood as a touchstone for you to be able to come back to where you were with me and remember me, but in remembering me also have a sense that I am still present with you. That's what it means, do this in memory of me. It means do this as your way of reconnecting to your felt sense of my immediate presence. Okay, that's what's tied up in that word, remember me. In English, it says remember. In Greek, it's anamnesis, which means recall in the sense that a car is recalled. Recall me to yourself. In other words, when you celebrate the Eucharist, I will come back to you, but not as you saw me before. I will be with you all days, even till the end of the age. So, the early Christians were remembering all these things he said. They were trying. They were trying to piece them together into some kind of coherent vision that they could instruct the others in. If you read the early catechetical homilies of 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 the early bishops, in particular uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, these are the earliest baptismal instructions that the early overseers gave to the new catechumens who were baptized underground as being engrafted into this mystical mystery of the risen Christ. And when they talk about those, 
they, they themselves were feeling their way forward in trying to grasp what did Paul mean when he said, in him we live and move and have our being? What did Paul mean when he said, all things were made through him, all things were made for him, all things are made in him? What does it mean to live in him and have our being in him? What does it mean that I will be one with you as the Father and I are one? What does all that mean? So they were beginning to experience and amplify their experience of being one with the risen Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in a kind of divine alchemy of blending and annealing here. So in those very early Christian church fathers, as you read their explanations of who Jesus is, they start explaining that the Holy Spirit welds us to him, like, uh, like two candles being uh, melted together under the fire of the Holy Spirit. Your light and his light become the same light. So now his light glows within you because you are, as two candles are melted together as one wax, you are now you are now merged, you are now melded, you are now welded, you are now annealed to the very person of Christ. And that's, that's how they saw, they saw the early Christian mysteries, Eucharist, Confirmation, and Baptism. Those three mysteries, what was that process of welding the human being to the risen Christ, such that they, they now glow with the, the, the life and the fire and the heat and the truth and the gifts of the second person of the Trinity. The most, the most infamous, or most famous, I guess not infamous at all, the most famous and repeated analogy that the early church fathers used to describe this melding process, this, this blending process. They used all those images. They never wanted to lose the distinction between a human being and God. But by the same token, they did want to say, as we saw last week with Maximus the Confessor, in the same measure that God became man, man becomes divine. They wanted to communicate that sense that all that was in Christ is now in every human being who is united to Christ. And in truth, every human being, by virtue of the resurrection and this massive nuclear explosion that has now permeated the cosmos with its energy, now, in truth, every, every human being is united with Christ, including every, every created object is now united with Christ. But most of the created object, all, all the, so, so all the people created with Christ are not aware of their union with Christ. But those who are deified give their personal interior assent to this process of unification of their human persons with the divine person of Jesus risen from the dead. So all that be so, but the most frequent use analogy used to describe this mystery and to communicate its, its, its intensity to people was the notion of iron being heated by fire. When you heat, take a blowtorch and you heat a piece of iron, it starts to glow. It becomes incandescent. And the fire itself starts to transform the lead. It, it, never, it never ceases to be iron, but, but you can't say where the iron stops and the fire begins. The fire has permeated the, the, the inert object there such that it has become, it's itself, but it's also at the same time more than itself. And you can no longer draw a dividing line between where the fire starts and the, and the iron or the lead stops. So they use that analogy a lot to give an example of what a person looks like who is fully merged with Christ. They are still themselves, they are still the same thing that they were before, just like the iron never ceases to be iron. But now they are permeated with an energy. We call it grace. The Eastern Fathers call it the energies of God. They are permeated with the light of God, the attributes of God, the, the light of God, the, uh, the uh, wisdom of God, the, uh, the fire of God, the love of God. All the attributes of God are, as it were, infused into that human person through their union with Christ. And, and the human person, to a certain extent, is able to control the intensity of that transformation. Because with our freedom, we can say yes to it. 
we can learn more about it, we can enter more deeply into it. It's as if it were, we can open our heart more to it. And the more we say yes, like Mary, the deeper the attributes of God are conceived within us. Just as Mary conceived the divine person of Jesus in her womb, we conceive of Christ in ourselves also to the extent that our fiat parallels that of Mary. Let it be done to me according to your word. So early Christianity was all about giving God permission to possess us without destroying us, kind of like um, the burning bush that was enveloped by the fire, but it was consumed, but not destroyed. That was another image of the deified person that the early church fathers used to explain what was happening when you join this gathering. Okay, now that whole sense of Christianity, once Christianity became public, the fire of that vision and the depth of that explanation, it went away immediately. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people became Christian. There were not enough original witnesses to communicate to them that original experience of complete inward and outward transfiguration by the descent of the Holy Spirit and the impact of the risen Christ. There were just not enough. So, so Constantine started appointing or told the other overseers, appoint more overseers. So you have overseers who are basically baptized pagans trying to instruct other pagans about the mysteries of Christianity. And very soon after Christianity became public, some of the original Christians who had learned deeply about their faith and were living this deified union with God through the celebration of the mysteries in the gatherings. <laughs> It'd be like somebody leaving this gathering and going into a coffee clatch at your local parish and they say, hey, tell us what you learned on the gathering today. <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> you know, I heard it. I, I like it, but I can't repeat it. Well, yeah, don't even talk to them. They couldn't understand. And that's how the early church was. But once it became public, Constantine says, tell them, write it down, put it in a book, just give it to them. So they know, I just want them all Christian, because this God is really powerful. Constantine remained a pagan right up until his dying day. He never, his mother, by contrast, Helena, she knew everything that I'm telling you today in, in the way that was available to her at the time. But her son knew nothing. He was baptized on his deathbed, like a lot of people are, just to, because he didn't, he, he knew that the realm of the gods is a scary place. So if, if, if baptism is going to give me eternal security, I'm going to get it. So it was a purely transactional relationship with God. And of course, that's what religion for most people has become. It's become a transaction, ritualized and codified with laws and rules. And then it's given to you as a program. And the promise is, if you follow this program, you will avoid perdition and you will gain bliss somehow. And that's totally other than what early Christianity was all about. But that's what it became. And very early in that process of kind of bastardizing or diluting or dumbing down or pedestrianizing or banalizing the Christian mystery, at that point, Christianity, which was a movement, started to become an institution, <laughs> okay? Be previously, it was something that was caught. Now it becomes something that is taught. And people who are taught things <laughs> don't always grab onto them with the same enthusiasm as those who are shown things. So the church went from a show me state to a tell me state. So Christianity basically became codified rumors about what happened way back when. There was this man and he died and like, you know, the like the uh, groundhog seeing a shadow he came out of his his tomb for a minute and saw the shadow and, and and six more weeks of winter you know so that's what the resurrection has become for a lot of people it was not that way for the original witnesses and those who were part of the original community or those who had been taught or or instructed really it was an in, it was an indoctrination it was it was an initiation those who had been initiated into the mystery of their oneness with the immediately present risen Christ through the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. 
those who have been initiated into that vision and that practice of the faith, those people very soon could not recognize the version of Christianity that they were starting to see pop up in the buildings that Constantine was erecting for the celebration of the Christian mysteries. So they said, we don't like this version of Christianity. We're going back to the original one. Well, well, where are we going? Christians are everywhere. I know where we'll go. We'll go out to the desert. So they went to the deserts of Palestine, and they went to the deserts of Egypt, and they founded the first monasteries, which were not places of worship, places of gathering for like-minded people who wanted to enter more deeply into the koinonia, the community, the communion, the intercoursal relationship with each other and with the Trinity that Christ had promised them. May you all be one as my Father and I are one. So the Christian communion fled the public, public display of putting people together and calling it a community. That's what we have in most churches. You're just babies in a bread box rolling around together, hoping something happens. That's not what it was. This was a deeply intentional community of people who would die for each other because they would die for him. And so, and so that vision of Christianity as essentially a religion of martyrdom, of witnessing at the expense of the secular order and even at the expense of the sacred order. The sacred order, whether it's in religion, a bureaucracy in a diocese, or in society, a, bu a bureaucracy is a bureaucracy. It has nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel cannot be chained. The gospel cannot be codified. The gospel cannot be um, legislated. Even, and so canon law and the rest of it, it all has its place, but it all has its place to help people get into a place where they can catch the original fire. And that's the fire that John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd prayed for. He said, we need a new Pentecost here. He's the one who called the Second Vatican Council. And they said, where are we going to find the new Pentecost? He said, we're going to follow these people like Cardinal Ratzinger here and Henry de Lubac and uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar and Jean Denis Lou and Yves Congar and going all the way back for, for a couple of generations. These men have been telling us we need, we need to return to those early church fathers who instructed those first Christians. We need to recapture, recatch the vision that allowed these martyrs to have a church of martyrs because we're coming into a society where we're going to be called upon to be martyrs. Pope Paul VI picked this theme up when he wrote Humanae Vitae. He said, the way the early Christians lived in their monogamous, non-contracepting, non-aborting lifestyles because of their vision of Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, because they wouldn't do it, we can't do it, because to be in Christ is to be made incapable of killing anyone, at least in terms of murder. So we can't do it. But, but it's not that we can't do it because I say we can't do it. We can't do it because of who Christ is. And when we're in him, we become, we become the kinds of persons who can't do it. And even if we think we ought to be able to do it, that reveals that we're not yet in Christ. So that was Pope Paul's encyclical. He said, and, and the contemporary culture is not going to buy this at all. Why not? They don't share our vision. We must recapture our, we must stay true to our vision, regardless of what the culture says. And, and John Paul II and Benedict XVI and Francis are continuing the same push that the church needs to become a, a society as an alternative that lives in an alternative way from the way the mainstream culture does. And indeed, from the way the mainstream stream churches do as well. Um, you know, the church persecutes its prophets just as the, the state does. So, um, so that's, that's what was happening in the early church. That, but, and so it's that vision that caught fire in the early church. And then I talked about those concentric circles of, of, of divine energy moving out from the resurrection. The first three, four, five centuries the Spirit raised up people. 
that we call the early church fathers, starting with Paul and Paul and St. John. They were the two apostles of the man from Nazareth who began to explain to those who had caught fire the full mystery of the person of Christ. They began to show them that the one that you saw in the man from Nazareth is actually the eternal word. And he's also the final word. All things are meant to fit into him at the end because all things were in him perfectly at the beginning. And what you see in history is the, is the, is what was in the beginning coming to its full fruition in the end. And that's why all these things that happened have been necessary for the full flowering of what he has come to unveil to us. Christ is, is the apocalypse. He has unveiled the final vision of who he is, who his father is, and what our place in him is, and what the place of the whole creation in him is. And everything in him is good, and everything in creation is good. And what looks to us as evil in the moment appears that way in, 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 as an illusion to us to get us to do violence to each other. And that's a great mystery. It's the mystery that we call the mystery of evil. But evil in itself is nothing. It's a privation of something that is, is divine. And so what we see now is history is coming to be of that which always has been destined for the world from the beginning. And that's, that's the vision that we, we try to purvey on these gatherings, and, and we, we come back to it again and again. Um, so I'm going to put up, we're going to do another screen sharing here as we did last week, and I've given the handout here. Um, I've given a handout here so the people in the room will have the same one I'm about to put up on the screen. Okay. And uh, these, what, what you're seeing now on the screen are, are, are kind of five uh, axioms or kind of five statements that are a, in, to my mind, a, um, a very good summary of this tradition that I was talking about earlier that pervade the early church, continues to pervade the Eastern church and has been cl clamored for by our previous popes, has been, been clamored for, for the, the la ever since Vatican II and before Vatican II. So here are the main assumptions and, 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 and I'll try to, try to decipher some of the language for you. Okay, but basically what is being said, and this is, this is um, from David Bentley Hart's, um, David Bentley Hart's um, book called You Are Gods, and that comes, of course, from the prayer that I quoted earlier by Athanasius, God became man so you could become God. The early church fathers said, when you are one with Christ, you are gods in God. In fact, you are created as as human beings intended for a divine end. Okay, so you are created in the image and likeness of God. God is God with a big G. You are gods with a small G. You are many hymns in a created form. Okay, we call that created form being human. God is being God. You are being human, but your being human is of a piece with God being God. And, but you just don't know that. So when you know that, you will be able to enter into your own divine calling as a human being, okay? So that's what we're saying here. Um, so I'll go through these, and then we'll try to, try to make them a little simpler. So in this vision, the sole and sufficient natural end of all spiritual creatures is the supernatural. So grace is nothing but the necessary liberation of all creatures for their natural ends. Let me try to explain that by recalling the image that Patty used before the gathering began today. When 
when a when a sculptor comes to a piece of marble, the normal person sees a piece of marble. The sculptor already has the end in mind. He already knows what this sculpture is going to be. What this first axiom says is, when God created everything, he saw its own natural end. So the, 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 the final product was already in God's mind before he created the creature. So the perfection of the creature is already there from the beginning. All that has to happen, and this is where God's touch or carving needs to come in, all that needs ha to happen is God needs to remove that which is obscuring the perfection that's already present in the person. Okay, so we are created perfectly. I've said this before. Now, we do have what we call original sin, but original sin is not inherent to the natural, perfect person God created each of us to be. But original sin means that when we look at each other, we look at each other as blocks of marble, whereas God sees us as the perfect human beings he created us to be. And Grace is God's chipping away everything in us and around us and that clings to us that is not really us as he envisions us. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, that's what's being said here. We are created perfectly, though we don't see ourselves or others that way. We need grace. And in my analogy here, it's it, we need God chipping away all the things that prevent us from seeing the inherent beauty and perfection of ourselves and of others. Do you see that there? So if you say, well, original sin is evil, or looking at each other as a block of granite is evil, what I really want to say is, no, it's a deception. You're seeing something that is not really there. You are seeing it because you don't see it as God sees it. That's why Jesus said, Peter, you're thinking as human beings here, not as God does. Okay, so enough for number one there. Number two, nature stands in relation to supernature as prime matter to form. Now, you didn't have to know Aristotle to know what he's referring to there. But the, the second sentence expresses it pretty well. Nature, by which he means the whole created world. Okay, human beings, plants, animals, etc. Anything that exists, nature has no real existence and can have none, meaning creation cannot account for itself. It's not self sustaining, it's not self creating. That which is requires a cause that preceded it, that has to be a cause greater than that which is. Okay, nature in itself can have no real existence, has none, and can have none. It is entirely, he says, creation, nature is entirely ontological patience before the formal causality of supernature, and only as grace can nature possess any actuality at all. Now, that's pretty philosophical. Let me try to explain it to you in simpler terms, okay? When you think of a human being, I shouldn't do too much philosophy here because it would take a lot. But if you think of matter as dough, clay, now clay, everything, this is an analogy now. If you think of matter as clay, clay is no thing until it's formed into something, okay? So form gives matter its identity, okay? And in truth, what this is really saying is form for the artist, form comes before matter. So the artist has an idea of what something's gonna look like. And he says, get me some clay to do it with, okay? God is like that. God says, I have an idea <laughs> of what I want to make. Get me some matter. And what we call physical reality is the matter that God uses to form certain things. Okay. Now think of humanity as a, as a single lump of clay. 
And God takes that lump of clay and forms Joe and William and Patty and Martha and Phil and the rest of us. So every, every so, so form is what I, determines the identity of matter. And form in that sense is more powerful than matter. And matter is nothing without form. It's kind of like the three kinds of umpires, you know, there are. There's the umpires who say there's balls in their strikes, and I call them like they are. And the second umpire says, well, yeah, there's balls in their strikes, but I call them like I see them. And the third umpire says, yeah, there's balls in their strikes, but they're nothing till I call them. <laughs> it's more like the latter, okay? Form determines, I mean, yeah, form determines the identity of matter. Okay. So what he's saying there is that creation is a big blob of nothing until God gives it form, okay? So it's only as matter receives the touch of God that it can become anything at all, anything recognizable at all, okay? What he's trying to say here is that there's nothing that is that does not come from God. The stuff that, the stuff, the matter that, that allows who we are to show itself, the matter of my body is also a gift from God to create me whom God envisioned from all eternity. So nothing I have, whether my matter or my form, belongs to me. And yet there is still a me there. Okay, that's what he's trying to say here. So, Okay. Number three, no spiritual creature could fail to achieve its naturally, sup naturally supernatural end unless God were the direct moral cause of evil in that creature, which is impossibly, which is impossible. In other words, no one can be prevented from, no block of marble can, preve can be prevented from showing itself as the perfect person God intended it to be, unless God were to put a stop to the process, in which case God would be frustrating God's own ends, which is impossible. Okay, if that's, that's a better, easier way of understanding that. Conversely, God saves all creatures by removing extrinsic physical, that is to say, non-moral impediments to their natural union with him. Okay, so God is always working to free us from the illusions that keep us from experiencing ourselves as he has created us. Okay, that's an important. God is constantly at work removing barriers to us appreciating, experiencing, grasping, and understanding, and seeing ourselves and others as the supernaturally destined persons that he has created us to be in our own inherent natures. Okay, so number four, God became man so that humans should become God. Only the God who is already human can become human, and only a humanity that is already always, always already divine can become God. We went over this last week, and this is quite difficult to understand. But if God from all eternity intended to become human, Humanity itself must have been somehow in God. Humanity must have been divine in some sense in order for the divine to become human. Okay, so humanity must have always, always been somewhat divine. And divinity must have always, always somehow been human at the same time. What that really means is that humanity and divinity are not opposites. Humanity is enclosed within divinity without, without losing its identity as humanity. Humanity is a form within the form of the forms, <laughs> to, to put it in Platonic terms. That's how Plato described it. 
Okay. So humanity in God is, is a divine capacity that God himself would exercise in the incarnation. And conversely, our humanity is of God from all eternity. That's, that's a good way to say it. That's a perfectly orthodox way to say it. And, and, and in the end, this is, this is what I'm trying to purvey on these gatherings. And, and uh, how much time do we have? We have a little bit of time here left. I want to go in a slightly different direction, perhaps, at the end here. But, but everything that's been said in one through four is kind of summed up in five, though it's a bit difficult to grasp. God is all that is. That, that, that to me, that is the, the, the most arresting phrase. It, it can go wrong in certain ways, but, it can, but if we stick to that, we can understand what the early church was all about, why, how we can recapture that original vision. See, whatever is not God, like we think of ourselves as not God. We think of creation as not God. But, but move back to the first step. Nothing is apart from God. Okay, so everything comes from God, but it, but it doesn't come from God and then have its own independent existence. It couldn't sustain itself. Cre finite reality is, it does not have infinite power to sustain itself. It, even finite reality, that which is other, so-called other than God, must still somehow be in God in order to exist at all. Not just in the beginning, but at every moment. Everything that is contingent is at every moment contingent on the power of that which allows it to be in the first place. But I, I wouldn't make a good philosopher. I mean, this, this is really important for you to understand. So finite reality, created reality, nature partakes of divinity while at the same time being something other than God. Okay, so this is the way he says it. Whatever is not God, meaning nature, creation, us, exists as becoming divine. And as such is God in the mode of what is other than God. But God is not the other of anything. See, God is not in competition with us. God is no more affected by what we do or who we are than the sky is affect, affected by the clouds. And yet it has pleased God to allow us to be and to be as we are. As an extension of his own life in some sense without thereby usurping the prerogatives of God. God is sharing himself with us in human form. We are the recipients of the life of God as created beings. And at the same time, we have a kind of identity in God that is known only to God. See, everything that is is of God, is from God, and is an extension of God's own life in some sense. That's us. But we are also self-conscious creatures. So we, are, we have also been given a share in God's own awareness of himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We talked last week about the son being the, the image of the father in the mirror of the spirit. Did you listen to that gathering, Patty? So you know what I'm talking about, okay? And I talked last week on that, that the, that the reflection, it does have a kind of reality, but not the same kind of reality as that which gives rise to it. So Jesus is the begotten one of God and, and the father, the face, the, the original, is the unbegotten. So Jesus is, is the face of that which nobody can see. And as such, he has a kind of derivative identity. We also have a derivative existence. Our existence is derived 
from at every moment from a source beyond ourselves. That source is God. But we've also been given a share in that reflective self-knowledge of God that Son and Father enjoy through the Holy Spirit. That's where we can say, I know that I am. Well, who is the I who's saying, I know that I am? Well, that I is not the person we identify ourselves with on Facebook. <laughs> that I is the person God created us to be. That's that perfect person in that block of marble who's still coming, not coming to be exactly, but coming to manifest, to show himself or herself in the fullness of the perfection that God created each of us to be in the first place. And history is God's chipping away of anything that prevents us from coming to be in time and space and in eternity. God's grace is the chipping away of anything that prevents us from being fully born, as it were, or becoming fully I got to find the right word here. I had it there a minute ago. So we're not perfect. We are perfect in God's sight. We are not perfect in our sight because our vision is still obscured by things that God does not see because he possesses a knowledge of things that we do not possess. We possess we possess a partial knowledge of ourselves and others and and, and, and in that partial knowledge, we get afraid and we are in darkness to a certain extent. Now in the garden, Adam and Eve did not look at each other originally. They did not look at each other maliciously or suspiciously, but they came to do that. And that's the nature of impartial knowledge. It seems to generate fear. Fear generates Thoughts, thoughts generate judgments, judgments generate emotions, emotions generate actions, and negative thoughts generate violence. Cain kills Abel. So what you see in the early chapters of Genesis is how impartial knowledge devolved into accusation. And we, we have now constructed a mythology about evil and the origin of evil and the creatures that that, that promoted that evil, an interpretation, by the way, of Genesis that was unknown in the early church. So I don't want to go into the creation temptation garden myth at this point. We'll do more of that on our, perhaps on our trip, but maybe not. But in, in any case, yes, there, there is evil, but evil is an illusion. And evil is basically not seeing what God sees. It's a, it's a deprivation. It's a privation. It's primarily a primation, privation of vision. When I lack full understanding, I draw conclusions that, that appear to fit the facts about myself and others, but in truth don't. But, but when I say in truth, that means in Christ. I am the way, the truth, and life. Only he knows the truth about us. And he, anything that God creates cannot not be perfect. But everything we create in our mind is quite imperfect because it comes from imperfect understanding. Okay, that's a brief aside on, on evil there for a minute. But the point is that we are divinely human in our creation, just as Christ is humanly divine in his beginning. If you grasp that, <laughs> just let me say that again. We are divinely human in our creation, yet, yet most of us have not known that, and most of us have not assented to that, okay? In truth, it is in truth. That's the case. That's how God sees us. So God is at constantly at work removing from us any obstacles to us coming into full possession of ourselves as divinely human creatures, and what the early church called deification is a human person fully alive through grace in God as God saw him, which is as a partaker of God's own life. Another good one. Okay, so, and so that's the vision that I'm always working from here. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I'll leave it at that. I'm gonna take down the screen share because that, that language is it's not as good as the handout I put up on there last time. We have a couple of chats. I'm going to read a couple from uh, Stephen Roberts and then there's a link from Cheryl as well that uh, would be well worth uh, uh, clicking on to. It'll bring you to Athanasius's explanation of God became man so man could become God. It's, thank you for that, Cheryl. Stephen Roberts says, time and space do not diminish the force with which Christ Paschal mystery reverberates throughout the cosmos. You can see why I like Stephen Roberts. Mm -hmm. Time and space do not diminish. In other words, the years separating us from the resurrection do not in the least diminish the reverberation of the resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that took place, that earthquake is still happening. In fact, one of the things I wanted to talk about on the gathering today is that that shaking of the foundations is the, is the complete destruction, even though we've not seen it yet. It's the complete, we're, we're seeing bits and pieces of it. Literally, not only a nuclear explosion, but you, you could say that nuclear explosion of the resurrection that I'm talking about moving out through the cosmos and through time and space to the furthest reaches of the universe, by the way, there's nothing that has not been impacted by the resurrection. Um, it literally is an earthquake that will bring down every constructed political and social order. And it will also bring down every politically constructed religious bureaucracy. The church is imploding, the society is imploding. And what I wanted to speak more about today, I'll maybe address it for a few minutes here because Stephen's comment kind of triggers it. I started to say this last week, I've said this in fragmentary ways on other gatherings, but the end of Christendom, the end of the church as we know it, the end of the, of the institutional church as we know it, and the end of society as we know it, the end of civilized political arrangement as we have known it, is itself a result of Christianity. Christianity itself is the catalyst for the implosion of the church as the church has become what it is. Okay, and I will maybe talk a little more about that before we finish today. And if that interests you, I'll talk about, talk about it more on a subsequent gathering. This other one from, from Stephen, the mysteries of Christ transcend time and space. Even though we come to see the revelation of Christ in time and space, Time and space do not confine him. The resurrection shows this clearly. We see the risen Lord passing through locked doors and the apostles seeing him touching his hands. So it is. Creation is the outcome of the redemption wrought in Christ. The end is in the beginning and the beginning is in the end. Creation came to be through the God-man Jesus Christ and his deified humanity. And it will return to the, to the deified Christ at the end. Christ will be all in all. But he already is all in all. The, the world will awaken to the fact that, that they are in him and he is in them. And who they are is him being him in them. <laughs> Without the destruction of them. Actually with the divinization of them. Okay. And, and I... I really prefer staying on that topic of divinization rather going, going in to show you how Christianity is the solvent of everything. Um, but I'll do that very briefly. Uh, do you want me to do that? I mean, I, I, do I want to switch gears here? Shall we just end on a nice note of uh, deification? Or has everybody got the, the, the sense here of, of where we're going? And so, so what you've seen in, in our church over the last... <laughs> 60, 70 years, maybe 100 years, is people trying to pull us back, trying to restart that fire. You know, this the movement John Paul tried, the new evangelization, we're trying it in St. Louis here, the all things new. It is true, Christ makes all things new. 
but none of that can be none of that can be legislated. You can't make all things new just by combining buildings and getting people who already don't like each other in the same room just in closer quarters. It doesn't work that way. So there has to be a spiritual transformation. And, and so I believe gatherings like this and others that I've mentioned to you, you see, if you look in the Christian world, they're, they're, whether Catholic or Protestant, we're talking now about the Western world. The Eastern church has never lost what I'm telling you in these gatherings. Now, the ordinary parishioner in an Eastern Orthodox church because they've been so westernized by American civilization permeating and corporate culture permeating everything, even Eastern orthodoxy is being dumbed down and diluted and, uh, and secularized. And, and of course, the orthodox response to that, like the Latin mass response to that in the West, is to try to retrench that original vision in a more archaic form of itself. So if you look at Eastern Orthodox guys, they've got those big hats on and they're trying to dress up just like St. Athanasius did. It's all the garments that they wore in the Constantinople Roman Empire when the empire moved to the East. It was very much aligned with the secular powers of the day. So all the priests in Eastern Orthodoxy and Eastern Catholic uh, theology, they have these gold investments. They look like they look like secular potentates. And in, in the early church, Constantine wanted the great overseer of the Christian church right next to him because he wanted the Christian God to bless his empire. The whole Council of Nicaea was called because Constantine wanted all these theological squabbles about the divinity and humanity of Christ and the deification of human beings, none of which he understood and desired to understand. He wanted them all just to go away, and he wanted them to be like Rodney King. Can't we just all get along? Can't you Christians all get along? Well, no, they can't, because people who knew Christ and died for him and suffered martyrdom they're fighting with each other. We've got to get this right. Christ sent the Holy Spirit to deify us. And some said, yeah, but he didn't destroy human nature. And others said, yes, he did. And he replaced the divinity with humanity. And there was just one nature in Christ and two persons. No, there were two persons in one nature. They were fighting with each other all the time about how do we explain this mystery of humanity and divinity united in Christ and now us united with him? How do we explain that? How do we explain the Trinity? We've come to see that God is a triune mystery of personal presence. How do we, how do we explain that? And so Constantine says, I don't care how you explain it. Just get a common code you can all agree to. And out comes the Nicene Creed, okay? But they did not, that didn't stop the fighting. They can, they're still fighting to this day. We have a thousand different Christian churches because nobody believes the same thing. Okay, so the early church was a concophony of different voices, but what they all had in common was they knew that he was still present with us. And they knew that they were one with him. How they explained that, how they went about it, how they borrowed images. The West was not able to talk to the East because the West spoke in Latin, which had different words for person and nature. And the East couldn't speak to the West because we had four different words for person. Which one do you mean? And that's why Athanasius was so key. He was at the Council of Nicaea trying to bring these two warring groups or the many warring groups together into a common phrase. And he was the one who said, let's all agree on the word consubstantial, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, consubstantial with the Father, not, not, may, not, yeah, light from light, God from God, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. And they could all agree to that, but they all had different understandings of what it meant. So that squabbling went on. But what happened was the emperor then tried to tried to tried to make sure that that the bishops who surrounded him would support him, and there were other bishops who said no the 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 reign of Christ does not bow to any emperor with earthly powers. His kingdom is not of this world. So you, now you had some bishops who were kind of wanting to sidle up and be part of the power structure in Constantinople. And you had other people like Athanasius and others who were expelled and exiled 
five different times Athanasius was kicked out of his hometown because his view of the lordship of Christ was different than the emperor's view. So you have this clash between church and state, and there you can begin to glimpse, and I'll leave it at that for today. There you can begin to glimpse that Christianity can never be fit, fit into a political structure. We always obey the voice of God higher than the voice of the state. The state is not God. And, and, and um, we know from Jesus, you know, destroying the temple, destroying the temple. I mean, they said, look at this beautiful temple. He says, um, uh, the, the time is coming when you will worship God neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, but you will worship God in spirit and in truth. You know, I am greater than Moses. I am greater than, you know, what was the, the especially with the temple, you know, he, he presented himself as the new temple. He presented himself as the dwelling place of God. So Christianity had no temples, as I told you. They were accused of being atheists. Why? Because they, their religion was not dependent on external political arrangements of any kind. They were a people being led by the Spirit, gently guided by overseers. But within that community of believers, there were different gifts. And there was wide latitude for those gifts to be exercised. And, and in their gatherings and in their sharing of their gifts and beyond that into the civil order, they continued to take that vision of Christ present in every person. And so they began to live in a different way and they began to create communities that were alternatives, both to the temple cult and to the civil cult. And that became the church. And that's, that's where God is leading the church back to a more impoverished, a more, um, a more uh, communal, a more... Um, what, what's the word I want? Collaborative, a more, you know, that, and that's why Pope Francis, he makes a point of saying, you know, and this has been the title that's been used of popes for years, but never really embraced. Pope is always known as the servant of the servants of God. You know, remember Jesus washed the feet of his apostles and he said, those who rule in my kingdom will rule as slaves, not as kings. But look what's happened to the church. We, Pope, Pope is get garbed. See, the world wants a king. And God is a king whose only crown is thorns. And God is a king whose only, only uh, uh, badges of honor are wounds. And so France, Saint Pope Francis, I mean, St. Francis knew this. That's why Pope Francis took his name. Rebuild my church. So Francis started putting bricks in together to try to rebuild. God said, that's not what I mean bring about the spiritual revolution that is needed. And I think all the superstructure of the church kind of has to collapse in order for people to emerge from the rubble with the original vision of the church. Certainly that's been predicted for many years now. So let's finish with that. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Father.